Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Healing Conversations. My name is Einav Avni from Untangled Healing. Uh, mostly about myself, mostly the podcast is not about myself, but uh, about myself. Uh, I usually work with people with chronic pain and chronic illness to help them heal through energy healing. This podcast is really a bridge uh, for anyone with a message, with a passion, with a story uh, to, to reach people in the world that are looking for this message or passion or story. So let's get started. With me today, Marion Nixon. Marion, so lovely to have you here. How, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you, and very excited to be here with you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about you. I live in Cape Town, South Africa, and I had a childhood that was on the surface um, quite normal and very happy, but being one of five, I was the middle of five children and it ended up with what in late life I discovered is called childhood emotional neglect, um, where I had every, everything seemed, I had everything I needed, but my emotional needs were not met at the level that I, I required for, for healthy development. And as a result, I had a very poor self-image for most of my life. And with, as most people who have that will know, with it goes a strong inner critic. And along the way, I have learned ways of retraining that inner critic from instead of putting me down to actually supporting me. And I'm very excited to be able to share that with other people. Amazing. I, I like already what you're saying that you're actually able to to recognize where this inner critic is coming from because of course this is what you do but a lot of us don't really understand where it's coming from they don't necessarily know to connect the dots that it has started with you know emotional neglect in earlier um, mm -hmm. life you know in earlier childhood um, and sometimes people don't even recognize that they don't even recognize that not everyone has the same level of inner critic that is, you know, active. Yes, the inner critic voice is really the voices from the past that have been trying to help you, really. I mean, that, that, that what I discovered along the way is actually the inner critic is your friend, it's not your enemy. And because it, it's trying to keep you safe. So it's taking lessons from the past and situations that you've been through where that made you feel bad. And it's trying to stop you from going into that situ those situations again. But what happens is what worked as a child is no longer relevant as an adult. And so we need to, I say to my clients that that inner critic, it's your friend, but it's working with outdated information. You need to give it an update and get it to support you in ways that are constructive instead of destructive. Yeah, I like that. I mean, yes, the inner critic, I, I totally agree, is, is, is protecting you. It's trying to protect you without necessarily knowing if it's actually working for you or against you. So what, what can people do to understand that? How, how do they start to change their relationship with the you know, inner critic? There's several exercises. What worked for me in the beginning, before I even really understood what I was doing, but I, I was going through a bad patch in my life and came across an exercise where every time you say something negative to yourself, you reframe it in the positive. I was really startled to discover how difficult that was. <laughs> Uh, because then my inner critic started shouting at me saying that's not true that's not true <laughs> um so i decided to approach it like a grammar exercise and every time i had a negative statement in my head about myself i had to reframe it as a positive and it was a, and i used to tell myself this is a grammar exercise you do not have to believe it just say it and over a period of time, some weeks it took, um, that ne those negative messages started to calm down. And I was able, and I stopped t putting myself down to the same extent. And then along the way, I found 
went on a training course where we had to give each other a lot of feedback during the course. And we were instructed that positive feedback had to be said in, do you know, I, I like that, do more, you know, do more of it. And the negative feedback had to be, would you consider doing that differently so that, for instance, um, in speaking, would you consider speaking more loudly so that I can hear you more clearly? Mm. And it was a very intense workshop, uh, actually on um, presentation skills. And a few weeks later, I gave a presentation myself at a networking event and the time management was not very good. So instead of the hour I'd been allocated, I ended up with half an hour. And I didn't know how to condense my message into a half an hour. So I ended up just speaking for the half an hour and kind of trailing off at the end. Got into my car afterwards, expecting that inner critic to attack and instead the voice in my head said how would you like to do that differently next time and the difference that made I could feel my whole body relax instead of bracing for that in internal attack and so I now teach people that to try train themselves to look at to 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 use that sentence when you've done something and she was <laughs> that didn't work how would I like to do it differently instead of what in the past would have been a, at least a week of me beating myself up with why didn't I do this and why didn't I do that and instead of which I was able to start saying okay in future I need to have two versions of a talk in my head a long one and a short one <laughs> so that I can switch according to whatever happens at the time and then the most powerful one of all, well, when I say most powerful, those, those really do work. But one that it's a bit, bit quicker and it's, I find it more fun, is to imagine that your inner critic, that inner voice, is, um, has a face or a body, you know, that it's an entity separate from you, and have a conversation with it. And explain to it, well, firstly, you, I, that there's a process that I use where normally we kind of talk to it and say, why do you say these things? Think of something that is going to trigger it. Some statement or affirmation that, uh, you know, I'm earning all the money that I, that I desire and, or something. Um, and something that, that really triggers that inner voice. Then you say to it, why do you say the negative stuff to me? all these negative things. Why do you speak to me like this? And then usually out of that will come that something that it's trying to keep you safe. It's trying to prevent you from being disappointed or hurt or uh, um, criticizing you before other people criticize you <laughs> because that feels a little safer yeah. if it comes from itself. Whatever the reason, it's usually related in some way to be trying to be helpful, trying to keep you safe. So thank it for that and then explain that actually the way it's doing that is no longer relevant. It might have been relevant in the past, but it's not working now and what you wanted to say to you instead. And then, and, and then when it's agreed to doing that, you can thank it and, and end the conversation. And it, it obviously may take more than one conversation. But it's a fun way to deal with, and it's something you can do in your head in the moment. It only takes a minute or two when you find the inner critic raving. And I had a client who did a workshop on procrastination with me where I taught this technique. And she, she messaged me afterwards. To, she was, she's a coach. She was wanting to work with children, and she had planned to contact some schools. And... Um, she can't, and she, but she kept putting it off and putting it off. And she contacted me to say, I have contact, contacted four schools. I'm now waiting for the, you know, to, to go for the appointments. And she said, instead of my critic, you know, putting me down, it tells me that it says to me, you've got this. And so, yeah, by retraining that critic into that supportive statement, you've got this she was able finally to set up the interviews that she needed to get her business going. Yeah, amazing. 
I think one of the, the first things that people tell me when I work with them on the negative self-talk is that they have so much, such a, you know, incredible mental activity that they don't necessarily recognize when the negative voice is actually speaking. So a lot of the time, the first thing that we do is actually trying to, to slow down or to really pay more conscious awareness to the conversations that they are having with themselves so that they are able to recognize that you know, there's different elements to the conversations that they're having with themselves. Yes, I think that's where I started with that first exercise, um, with becoming aware of negative statements. And then uh, you, know, for, you, know, you encounter one, and then you start to f slowly start to get them more often and more often. And uh, as you reckon, you know, it's once you started the, the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a um, well, it is very it is fascinating. I, I I've been working with people with negative self talk and, and limiting beliefs for for a while, and uh, it's it's always interesting for me to to see. You know, obviously, I, I we all have a negative self talk, but we don't have to allow mm -hmm. it to to do the damage that it does when we're not recognizing that it's there. And and so when people understand when people get a chance to to look at the fears and, and see actually what is going on there, it brings them such a huge insight into what is going on in, in their lives because you know it's we don't we don't we don't often recognize it, right? It's all in our subconscious levels and, and we don't realize consciously what is stopping us and why we're not doing something. We just know that we feel stuck or that we, we can't move forward and we don't necessarily know the reasons. So when we bring it out into the open and we say, okay, now I understand it, you can def deal with it differently. And it is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, just recently, I actually had an interesting thought that maybe the uh, inner critic is actually playing devil's advocate. And you know, devil's advocate, come, it's a phrase that comes from, I think it's a Catholic church when they were making, when they want somebody is uh, put forward for sainthood there's a process where um, a, a, there's an official appointed to actually go and look at the reasons why the, that person should not be a saint. <laughs> not, beca not because they try, how can I say, it? it's to give a balanced view because you'll have people saying, oh, they did all these wonderful things. But then we all have a shadow side. Then to look at the other side of the person and see, are they really uh, so special to become a saint or are they not as special as people making out? So it's mm -hmm. not actually a negative process, even though it looks like a negative process, that the, the devil's advocate is on your side, but looking at your shadow. And I thought if that's the inner, if the inner critic is playing devil's advocate, maybe what it's doing is showing up our weaknesses so that we can work on them and and get stronger yeah i i think it's, it's exactly that our negative self-talk in my opinion it, it really we don't have to look at it as a showstopper but we can say to ourselves you know actually what is really scaring me about this idea a little bit like what you said earlier you know a lot of the time if you were, you're mentioning presentation and stuff for example and and we might say oh i'm 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 terrified of going on stage. I'm really scared about speaking in, all, in front of all of these people. All of these kind of fears and, and negative conversations. Mm -hmm. And and instead of just saying, you know, looking at it and taking it negatively, we can start saying, okay, what can I do about it? You know, if whatever it is, there is usually something that that is is hiding there that we can do differently. Usually, mm -hmm. maybe do more preparations or go back and and do some more research, talk to some people. Um, you know, put ourselves in a, I don't know, I don't know, choose a different light to, to, to go. And it, it's, there's things that we can do. So we're just really about teaching us to, to look at things in a different way, not to say, oh, anything that comes from our negative self-talk is negative and, and we have to, to follow it. We can actually say, no, it is here to, to bring a message. What is that message? What can we do with it? So it's yeah. it's fascinating, really, to mm -hmm. to start paying more conscious attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, another uh, useful question is to ask: Where did I learn that? Right, right. 
because we don't we're not born with an inner critic you know, look at how unselfconscious little children are yeah and they learn criticism from people who criticize them and then internalize that and that um yeah, and with some of the self work that I early self work that I was doing, I, I one day suddenly heard a whole lot of voices in my head saying, "You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't," and I realized that this. I, as I said earlier, I grew up in a large family, and this was all the voices of my family telling me what I couldn't do, and I suddenly realized that not many people told me what I could do. Yeah. I so I internalized all that I can't. I can't you know, do a real act of all of that thing at the last in that occasion when hearing those voices, it was it got to the point where I can't be. There's so many things that I can't do that actually I can't be. Um and I think, yeah, so instead of being encouraged as a child and told what I was good at. I kept being told what I couldn't do. And so I've had to unlearn all of that and learn to, to acknowledge what I'm good at. Um, and so asking that question, where does this come from? Where does this cr criticism come from? Where do these negative beliefs about myself come from? Helps to externalize them and realize that they're actually not who you are. Yeah. It just reminded me of um, <laughs> a conversation that I was having with my daughters in the car the other day. We was we were playing this game about um, you know guess the animal. We have some mm -hmm. one person think of an animal and we have to ask the questions and stuff. And uh, and I, I can't remember exactly how it went, but uh, someone said penguin was the the animal, and I said, but penguins can fly. So my daughter, without even thinking, said. You know, something like, excuse you, but I thought you were supposed to be a motivational speaker, you know, coach. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that, that's exactly that, yes. Um, <laughs> but I think I think uh, that aside, penguins aside, the conditioning is, is so, it's it's such an important thing to, to recognize, as you say, to like, who, where did you get it from? And, and to, to realize how often you take on truth that are not yours and how you lead your whole life from that and when you're trying to when you have that other voice that says hey you know do that thing that calls you do that thing that is you know inspiring you and you're passionate about and you feel like you shouldn't and now you have this huge fight inside of you because you're listening to all of these wrong voices voices that tell you what you shouldn't do not based on who you are I think that when you when you are aware of this, that there are voices that are playing all these uh, roles inside of you that are not your own, you do allow yourself to become freer. You, you really do have a whole new outlook on life. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's what I call that, you know, finding your purpose. And part of that in the work that I do is also for helping people find their purpose in life based on their own personal values and not because I think particularly as women, we often socialize to, to live in other, what I call the box of other people's expectations. And that socializing starts so early that we actually think that those are our own goals, our own desires when they're not really, they, they, yeah. they're what we've yeah. been taught. We need, we should want or do or, you know, how we should be. Things have eased up a lot since I was a child. Women have a lot more um, potential freedom to develop their own potential, go into areas of work that didn't exist for women when I was a child. But I still find that there is that underlying current that probably goes back centuries in the socialization of women, of you know the role that we play in society and the role which we have in relationships and what, yeah, there's still an element of what you can and can't do. Because for yeah. me, I say it's not yeah. only what is possible for you to do, but what is permissible for you to do. 
because yeah. a lot of us yeah. grow up with being told things are not permissible. Uh, yeah, totally, totally resonate with that because yeah, it's it's all about permission that you you give yourself or you believe that others won't give you that permission. And you know, sometimes at some points you you really believe that these permissions are make or break of whatever it is that you want to do in life. And and this is so so hard because it's not, you know, even in in very strict families or you know for whichever reason, you know, religions or, or culture or whatever. This is just an idea that your parents were holding on to and, and their parents before them. But, you know, is it is it really true? Is it really true that you, you know, the world will come to an end if you followed your heart and your passion? Mm -hmm. No. And I, you know, South Africa is a, a very diverse country we have many people from many different cultures and faiths mm. and I've noticed I in the area that I live in there's a lot uh, quite a large number of Muslim families and I'm starting to notice that the younger women are not wearing their their scarf the headscarf as much as they used to they they uh. so cultures do change traditions do change um, but uh, very slowly. But, you know, <laughs> there also has to be people who start the change, and those are the really brave ones. Exactly. I was just, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking back to stories, you know, about, you know, women that they were not allowed to go to school and, you know, their, their dads mm -hmm. would teach them in the middle of the night or, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I was really just thinking how co courageous, you know, how much courage these people had to say, I don't care about the norms and expectations and, and the rules. I feel that you should be allowed to learn it. So mm -hmm. it is really mm -hmm. fascinating. And and I really like how you kind of combining the finding your purpose with allowing yourself or, or learning to listen to the negative voice that is not allowing you to move forward in that direction. And, and mm -hmm. you know, your clients must feel very rewarded when they when they work with you well it my that part of my work has come out of working with people who had run out of motivation or they were kind of chasing shiny object you know the shiny objects and rushing off in all directions and and with having no in in the ended up with no direction to their business or their life or whatever and finding that when we actually looked at uh, what do you really want and took them through a specific process that I use and they weren't unhappy doing what they were doing, but they had what I called a heart dream. It was a dream that they thought would never be fulfilled. So they didn't speak about it. They didn't. And that's why I call it a heart dream because you kind of take it out of your head. You don't think about it because you think it's impossible yeah. or not permissible. So you sh you stick it away, but it doesn't go away. No. And, and there's that yearning inside of you to do something. You never feel quite fulfilled because that thing that you really want, you've buried. And, it's, and so when you actually access that, and then you find that actually it connects that out of that you get your sense of purpose because there's a there's a reason why that's that thing is calling you. It's because it's actually calling you to make an impact in the greater world outside of your own life. And mm -hmm. then and that usually is based on your values. I, I say I say exactly the same thing, and and for me, I take it to the other, to, you know, the next step because I work a lot with people with chronic pain and chronic illness, and I and I really do. I am able to show them that because they are not following that purpose or the the heart dream, as you call mm -hmm. it, this is why all the, the illnesses and the troubles come because they are not being true yes. to themselves because they yes. feel that they're not allowed to. There's no permission, and mm -hmm. and I, so I totally get what you're saying. It's so it's so. Yes incredible to to have this conversation you know where you able to say actually what is that thing that calls you you already know it it's already within you and actually this is really the reason why you, you were put on this earth 
how are you going to fulfill it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and uh, I'm, I'm actually an emotional freedom techniques practitioner. So I get that, yeah, that thing, because so often you with dealing with emotions and then the physical pain disappears as well. Right. Um, so, so there is also an aspect of emotional freedom technique where you can start with the pain and then you get to what the, the, the emotional under issues underlying it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it sounds, it sounds yeah, like yeah, it's all, you know, we're all connected. You know, everything is, is connected. We're, we're not a body or a mind. We're a body and a mind um, and spirit as well. I think it's the other way around. I think we are mind and a body. <laughs> And they're connected. They're not two separate entities. And too, so often, particularly in Western society, we're, we're, we're taught to disregard the body. Um, whereas, in fact, you know, we talk about feeling things in your gut. You know, you, we actually have brain cells in our gut. So, it, you know, that thing about you know, your, your intuition, that gut feeling, it's part of your brain. That's telling you something. Yeah. Really need to listen to that. I, I, I always say that we used to think that the brain was the most important part of our body, but now we know that the heart is giving commands to the brain as well. So, Yes. Uh, there, there's brain cells in the heart as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, Marian, we, we come to, to the end of our time together. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your wisdom and for... I'm sure people hearing this will, will start thinking about things slightly differently. And I really hope that they, you know, get in touch with you and follow you on, on your social media to, to learn more uh, about you and, and your wisdom. Uh, later on, I will add all of your links to the chat. And of course, uh, it's on YouTube so people can, can see it and it's there forever. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I've enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you.